Okay, so for let's let's go to lecture lecture three. I believe I have the rights. Yes. So in lecture one, we spoke about what computer is. Lecture two, um, we we talked about the types of computers that exist: the mini computer, the microcomputer, the mainframe, and the supercomputer. In lecture three, we're going to center that on storage in computers. Now, this is going to be the objective for lecture three. So the objective for this lecture is to introduce and define the concept of storage in the context of computer systems. So any of us who have a question, please, you can always raise your hand. I could see, I could hear some kids talking in the background from Kwame's um, you know, site. So I've muted everyone. If you have any question, just raise your hand, then we I'll give you access to talk. All right. So those that joined, we are in we are treating lecture three. Lecture one was for delve into what computer what the computer is. Lecture two is the types of computer that exist. Now we are talking about the storage of computers. That is for lecture three. So in this lecture, the objective is to introduce and define the concept of storage in context in the context of computer systems, and also to highlight the critical role that storage play in computer systems. We also will introduce and categorize the various types of storage devices that exist. And finally, you will get to know the distinction between the computer memory and the storage as well. So moving straight into the lecture, which is storage computers, storage in computers. Now, anytime you hear of storage in computers, what should come in mind, in your mind, is the process of storing and retrieving digital data for future use. So that is storage. So we store digital data mainly to retrieve it for future use. Usually this plays a crucial role in the overall functionality of a computer system. And because of that, we are able to preserve and also access the information that we store, retrieve them um, when the need be as to when we need to you know, use those data that we stored. So storage, makes it possible for us to preserve that particular data and access it over time, as many times as we want. Storage in computers can broadly be categorized into two main areas. We have the primary storage and the secondary storage. Usually when we hear of the primary storage, it's the same as talking about the internal storage. And for the secondary storage, it's the same as also the external storage. So let's talk about each one of them, the primary storage or the internal storage. So the primary storage, which we normally term as the internal storage or the main memory, is a type of computer memory that is directly accessible by the central processing units. In this case, the brain of the computer, which is the CPU. It is used to store data and instructions that are actively being used or processed by the computer. So the primary memory is very volatile, meaning that it's contain, it contains are lost when a computer is powered off. So in terms of the storage, there are two of them. We have the internal storage and the external storage. And for the internal storage, we said it's called a primary memory. And the secondary storage is called the external memory. So we are talking about the primary storage, which is the internal memory. Um, a primary memory, which we normally term as the internal storage or the main memory. And this type of memory is directly accessible by the CPU. The CPU would have to, you know, it has access to it directly. And it is used to store data instructions that are actively being used or processed by the computer. So the primary memory is volatile. We say it's volatile mainly because it's unable to save that data over a long period of time the moment we lose access to electricity or power, this type of memory loses its content. 
or any information that has been stored in that memory vanishes. So that is why we term this type of memory volatile. So there are two main types of primary memory. We're going to talk about each one of them. We have the random access memory. From here, you can see there are two main types of memory. We are just going to talk about the first one, which is the random access memory, which we term as a RAM, is a type of volatile memory that is used by the computer to temporarily store data and actively running programs. So anytime you have maybe Microsoft Word open and you are working in the word processing environment, we have the running program, the program which is already open, opened is termed as a running program. So this Microsoft Office, or Microsoft Word that we have opened is a running program and it's the random access memory temporarily store data of this particular running program. To know the characteristics of the random access memory, the key point here is volatile. As I, I keep reiterating, I'm going over again. Volatile in the sense that it loses its content when the power is turned off. Temporary storage um, used for holding the operating system, application program, and currently process data. <coughs> so that is the temporary storage for this particular one. Just a minute. All right, so use cases. So running applications, active data storage during computer operations. So these are areas where the random access memory normally takes effect. The cache memory. So <clears throat> the cache memory is a smaller high speed type of volatile memory that is located directly on the CPU or near it. It stores frequently access data and instructions to speed up CPU operations. In terms of its characteristics, it is volatile, just like the RAM. Cache memory loses its contents when the power is turned off. It is very fast. And it provides the CPU with a rapid access to the frequently used data. Um, at what's, in what scenarios it is, is it normally used? So storing frequently used instructions and also data for quick access by the CPU. That is about the cache. Now we have a secondary memory, which is also known as the external storage or auxiliary memory. So when you hear of auxiliary memory or external storage, then it means we are talking about a secondary memory. And this refers to storage devices that are used to store data for a long period of time. Even when the power goes off, we still have such data still stored on such memory. So unlike the primary memory, which is the random access memory and the cache, or some people will say cache, the secondary memory is non-volatile. Non-volatile in the sense that if the power goes off, we still have access to the data um, that is stored on it. So meaning it is able to retain its content even when the power goes off. Most secondary memory is crucial for storing large amounts of data of like files, um, operating system, software application, and so on. So here are some of the common types of secondary memory. So when you hear of secondary memory or external storage, we're normally talking about the hard disk. So the hard disk drives, which is the HDD. I remember I spoke about it in our first lecture. So ADDs are magnetic storage devices that use spinning disks to read and write data. In terms of its characteristics, they have high capabilities or 
in terms of capacity in storing data. So HDDs or hard disk drives usually offer large storage capacities. So making it suitable for storing vast amounts of data. You know, most of the RAMs that we have, the random access memory, that is the primary memory. We normally, we have about 16 gig worth of RAM, 32 gig RAM and so on. But with the hard disk, it goes beyond that. We have hard disks for like one terabyte, which is about thousand gig gigabytes. So when we talk of the secondary memory, the hard disk is one of them that's um, it's one of set um, storage medium. And it is good in a sense that it's able to store large amounts of data. Now, relatively, this type of data is relatively slow in terms of access. So access times are slower compared to the solid st um, state drive. Even with the hard disk, which is a secondary memory, there are two, we have another type, which is the solid state Okay, I think I'm I'm back. Yeah, my audio was misbehaving. Yeah, so relatively slower access speed. So when you compare the um the hard disk, which is the HDD, with the SSD, SSD are quite faster than this, and these are all secondary memory. Now, um, most times we normally find these SSD and um, HDD in desktops and laptops, and they help in long term storage. Um, of our data. Now for the storage, the solid um, state drive, which is the SSD, SSD use flash memory for data storage. So you see how our pen drives look like. It's able to copy files very fast compared to the SSD. So storage, the solid state drive the way it's um it's designed is just like the um, the flash drive or pen drives. They usually provide a faster speed compared to the SSDs. So in terms of characteristics, they have fast read write speeds. Um, SSD usually offer quicker data access compared to the SS um, HDD. In terms of reliability, um, there is no moving parts with the, with the HDD. We have you know, um, a magnetic object moving, circling around with a component reading data and also writing data. So it is more reliable, SSD are more reliable because there is no moving parts and it reduces the risk of mechanical failure. Um, you know, most in our time, most, most people have their HDDD crashed, um, which is the hard disk drives crashing because it's a mechanical, it uses a, mecha a mechanical way of, you know, storing and retrieving data. So common in modern laptops, desktops, and external drives will be the SSDs. SSDs have improved the performance of most of our current computers. We have external hard drives. This is also similar to internal HDD or SSD, but enclosed in an external case for portability. So it's external hard drive because we use them externally, unlike what the ones that are inbuilt that are stored in our computer. These ones, we usually use the USB to connect. They are external because they are most of the time, they are not part of the components of the computer. So for its characteristics, they are, they are portable. Portable in a sense that you can copy files onto it and take to any place, put it in your pocket, take to a different computer and access the files that you have in there. External drives can be easily connected and disconnected from any computer. The um, backups and also additional storage, they are used for backups and expanding storage capa um, capacity. So we can use external hard drive as a backup storage. 
So in case your computer, the data on your computer crashes, you, the, if you have an external hard disk that you've copied your files onto, you can use them as external storage or backup drives. In terms of connectivity, they are typically connected um, via the USB Thunderbolt or other external interfaces. But the USB is the most available ones that comes with some of these external hard drives. So these are some differences between the solid state drive and the hard disk drive. SS, solid state drive, which is SSD, use flash memory to store data electronically. HDD use magnetic storage technology with spinning disks to read and write data. Um, SSD significantly are faster access, have faster access time as there is no moving parts. Um, however, for the HDD, the access time is quite slower due to the mechanical parts and spinning disks. For SSD, there is no moving parts, making SSD more resistant to physical shocks and also vibration. Mechanical parts make HDD more susceptible to physical shocks and also vibration. Most times when you drop your HDD, there is a high probability it might crash. So you have to be careful when you use HDD. People or people that have um, in their personal computer SSD, their PCs are quite fast compared to the HDD. So sometimes when you are buying a laptop, of course, SSD are also very expensive compared to the HDD. So when you are buying a laptop, if it is HDD, you can see an HDD might be 500 gig and the price might be, let's say, 5,000 Ghana cities. You still would also find the same specification of the same hard drive, the same personal computer with SSD, possibly around 7,000 or 8,000. It's mainly because SSD are quite expensive compared to the HDD. People who are also smart also buy the HDD laptops and now replace the HDD with SSD. That is also another option that you can also take. So smaller and lighter as there is no moving parts. Most of the SSD drives or SSD, they are not heavy. They are very light. Um, but the HDD are very heavy because of the mechanical component that goes in there. And of course... SSD, they normally don't consume much power. And this leads to improve energy efficiency and longer battery life in portable devices. So if your laptop uses SSD, there's a high probability your battery will last longer when it's not running on electricity. But if you are using the HDD, it's your, the, the, it will consume your power and your battery might not be, might not last for long. It is silent in operation, but HDD sometimes you'll be hearing the hard disk, you know, spinning. But SSD, it's a silent. You don't hear anything. Availability in ranges of capacity from small to large, suitable for various applications. Any size that SSD is able to produce, we have HDD is able to produce. We have the same size being produced in SSD. So mind you, SSD are quite expensive than the HDD. So that is, these are some of the disadvantages or some of the um, differences between the SSD and also the HDD. Those of us who have not seen how the SSD looks like, this is how the SSD looks like. That is the HDD, that is the hard disk drive. This is how it looks like. This is for the computer. Um, next, and personal PCs, it could be a desktop, but this one looks more like the ones for the desktops. So, it's, you can see there, is, there are lots of mechanical stuff that goes in there. So, this disk, which, which is the brown disk that you see here, have to, it has to spin for this to read data on during the spinning process. You know, so... If it doesn't spin, there's no way this will be able to read data from it. So that is this is how the HDD looks like. When you open this one, this is how it looks like. Now, this is how the SSD looks like. 
can see it is smaller compared to this one. This is it. It is made up of chips, cache controller, memory. This is how it looks like. And this is how the laptop SSD also looks like. The laptop HDD looks like. So we still have the disk over here. And we have this device, which is the actuator trying to get information from the disk. So this is a mechanical stuff. So this moves and this one reads data from this one, from the disk. So that is how the HDD looks like. This is the one that goes into a laptop. This one goes into a desktop. And this one is how the SSD looks like. It's so small. It's made of chip. It doesn't have any, any moving parts. So it makes it a little faster compared to this one. Still on storage in computers, um, we have the USB flash drive. Most of these ones, you are aware of them. So they are compact and portable storage devices that use flash memory. So the flash drives, we normally tend over here, we term them as pen drives. Um, in terms of its characteristics, they are small form factor. USB drives are small and easily portable. They are plug and play. You put it in your computer and you're able to access it. So there is no external power source required. Connects to USB ports and the device, you can copy information from it. So it's normally used for data transfer, file storage, and also portability. It's quite portable. You can just put it in your pockets. Some, I used to have a flash drive as part of the components on my, my keys. Um, yes, so it's, it's, it's quite portable. We have the CDs, DVDs, and Blu-ray decks. So these are optical storage media that use lasers to read and write data. For its characteristics, we are able to write, we have the writable and the recordable. And we also have the rewritable. So it can be used to write data. So when you are copying information onto a, a CD, we, the term we use is burn. So write data to a CD, we call burn. So sometimes you tell somebody will tell you, I want you to burn this song for, um, I want you to burn this data for me. So that is copying. And when you burn it onto the CD, you can read data from it. So they have varied storage capacities. CDs, most of the CDs that we have, like the music CDs that we play in our cars and uh, and use, most of the time, the maximum space on the CD is 700 megabytes. So that is the old movies that you know were being produced by HM Films and Nigerian movies and all of that. They were running on 700 megabytes data until we had DVDs coming in. So DVDs usually range between 4.7 gigabytes to 9.0 gigabytes. So, but most DVDs are either 4.7 gigabytes. So it means if 700 goes onto a CD, dividing 700 by 4,700, um, will mean that you can have about, let's say, five movies, um, seven, five, 35, seven, six, 42, seven, seven, 49. So you, you could have about um, six or seven movies on a DVD. Whereas on a CD, you can have just one movie. On the average, you can have about six or seven movies on a DVD. That is how come most DVDs that have movies, you can see about four or five movies all in there, of which you can make a selection and play. So Blu-ray discs, so that is about 25 gig to 128 gig. Most Blu-rays have a storage capacity of about 25 gig to about 128. So you should have that in mind. Now we have what we call the cloud storage cloud storage um, when you hear of cloud storage is a service that allows users to store and access their data applications or files over 
the internet. So in the same way, if just like your your Gmail, your Gmail, you have a drive, Google Drive. So in Google Drive, you're able to store your files over there. All the files that you need. You can store your lecture materials. You can even store videos. You can store your personal pictures all in Google Drive. So Google Drive is a cloud storage service. So when you hear of cloud storage, it's a service that allows users to store and access their data, applications, and files over the internet. So it means... It's these, this particular storage is not on your personal computer. It is located somewhere in a remote, um, on a remote server. And access is given to you when you connect onto the internet to that cloud service. So instead of relying on the local storage de um, devices like the hard drive and the service, you can have a cloud storage which will enable your users to store and also retrieve data from remote service by maintaining a third-party service provider. In our case, Google Drive or OneDrive, I think that was for Hotmail or, yeah, Hotmail. They give us access to use some of their, you know, storage services for free. So that is about the cloud storage. So this storage model offers several advantages, including accessibility from anywhere with an internet connection, scalability, and also automatic backup. So certain files that you think are very necessary for you, which you need almost all the time, you can always load them on your cloud and wherever you are, you can always connect to it and use it for your access. You can access them wherever you are. Once you have internet access, you should be able to access such files. So that is about cloud storage. So these are the characteristics of a cloud storage um, service. The first one is the storage and remote storage. Remote in the sense that that storage is nowhere near you. It's possibly located somewhere else in a different geographical location. So data is stored on servers located in data centers operated by cloud service providers. And secondly, accessibility, users can access their data from any device with an internet access remotely by con remotely connecting to these cloud services at any point in time for collaboration. In terms of scalability, these cloud storage allows users to scale their storage needs up or down based on requirements without the need for physical hardware upgrade. And finally, we have the automatic backup. Most of the cloud storage devices or services offer this automatic backup. So many cloud storage services offer automatic backup features, ensuring data integrity and recovery in case of hardware failure or accidental um, deletion. So for instance, if I have OneDrive or Google Drive installed on my computer and there is a specific folder on my computer that's synchronized with the cloud service of Google Drive, any document that I put in that particular folder automatically goes online. So the moment I create a file and it is stored in the Google Cloud folder in my computer, Google Drive folder in my computer, automatically that file is sent onto the cloud. So if um, I happen to lose that file on my system, if I happen to have that file on my system and there's no way I happen to lose it on my system, I will have a backup in the cloud service. Your Lord says he has two terabyte SSD. Oh, great. So you can bring it for us to have a meeting. Uh, I think that will be fine to see it. Yeah, so SSDs are very good. But of course, they also have their disadvantage. You know, the more you you write and delete, right? It has a, a maximum number of deletion that could also happen. 
But in, in, in most cases, we normally don't reach that threshold. So SSDs are very good, yeah. All right, compared to HDD, yeah. So that is about automatic backup. Now, an example is, you see how now when you have an Android phone, you, you open your, you buy a new phone, you open a, you open your phone and the moment you sign up with Gmail, within a twinkle of an eye, about less than five minutes, you see all your contacts coming in. It's because um, all your most contacts are stored in the cloud. So the moment you have a new phone, your contacts are pulled back again to your phone so that you, you don't miss any of your contacts. So that is how the cloud system also works. All right, so these are the key components when you think of the cloud storage. So we have a data center, we have the service, we have networking infrastructure, we have the storage um, system. For a cloud storage service to be able to provide you all these, all the services that you need, and it means they should have all these things in place. They should have a data center. And a data center, in this case, cloud storage relies on large scale data centers that house service networking equipment, and also um, storage devices. Data centers are places where all these um, computers and network equipment comes into play. So MTM, for instance, has a data center. UMAT, for instance, we also have a data center. I'll call it a mini data center, although it is actually moving on to become a, a huge data center. So most organizations, go fields, have a data center. Sometimes we call it server room. You know, that is where the networking equipment and the storage devices are, they reside. So servers, these are responsible for hosting and managing user data in the form of files, database, or applications. So every cloud storage should have a server. So a server that is going to host your information. It should also have a networking infrastructure. And in this case, the networking infrastructure should have, should be a high-speed internet connectivity and networking infrastructure which would enable data transfer between users and also the cloud service. And finally, the storage systems. That is where the cloud provider use distributed storage systems to store and also retrieve data efficiently. So that is about cloud storage. And these are the types of cloud storage services that exist. So cloud storage services the types, the first one is the object storage, file storage, and block storage. For object storage, it's ideal for storing and retrieving large amounts of unstructured data, such as images, videos, and backups. So Amazon includes, um, an example is Amazon S3, Google Cloud Storage, and Microsoft Azure Block Storage. So for object storage, when you hear of object storage, the main emphasis is the fact that we store and retrieve large amounts of unstructured data. So such data could be in images, videos, and backups. And these are the companies that usually do that. We have file storage. It mimics traditional file in Microsoft OneDrive. So that is the file storage. And we have the block storage, provides raw storage volumes that can be used by virtual machines or other applications. So uh, virtual machines. So for instance, in your regular computer, you can create a virtual machine, which will be running maybe Ubuntu. Um, I have some of these virtual machines running. So there are times I'm using Windows 11. There are times I switch between, I mount um, a guest operating system like Ubuntu or Linus on my PC, and I'm able to use it to do other things. So that is where virtualization does come in. So we can create virtual machines, and these are blocks. It's often associated with infrastructure as service. So IAS, infrastructure as a service. An example include Amazon, EBS, and Google Cloud persistent text. All right. So these are the storage, cloud storage providers that exist. It is not limited to only this, there are lots of them. 
but the major ones are what have been outlined here. The Amazon Web Service, that is AWS, they usually offer storage services, including Amazon S3 for object storage and also Amazon EBS for block storage. We have the uh, Microsoft Azure, or some will also say Azure. They provide Azure block storage for object storage and also Azure files for file storage. Google Cloud Platform offers Google Cloud Storage for object storage and Google Cloud File Store for file storage. Dropbox, a popular file storage and synchronization service for personal and also business use. And finally, Box, a cloud-based content management and collaborative platform for businesses. So that is the cloud storage providers. And these, some, most of these, I'm sure some of you have seen the, the logos that are being used. Um, so these are some examples of cloud storage providers. All right. Um, now, um, talking about random access memory, Remember, we spoke about it being a, a volatile memory that is used by computers for temporary storage. So these were the characteristics, volatile nature, fast as, um, access time, temporary storage, and direct access by the CPU. I remember I spoke about this. So this is running operating system, storing data for actively running. These ones I spoke about it. So these are the types of RAMs. We have the dynamic RAMs and the static RAMs. So DRAM requires constant refreshing to retain data. SRAM does not require constant refreshing, making it faster, but more expensive. These ones are examples of RAMs that exist. We have the DRAMs and the SRAMs, and this is how the SRAM looks like. These are the regular RAMs that we have been using, the dynamic ones. And this one, they also exist but they are quite expensive. So the read-only memory, that is the ROM. ROM, we stand for read-only memory. It's a type of non-volatile memory that stores data permanently and cannot be easily modified or written, overwritten. It contains firmware or software that is essential for computer basic functions. So most of the time the ROM stores some kind of information for the BIOS to use. So these are the characteristics of the ROM. They are non-volatile in nature. They have read-only access and they contain essential software. So in terms of the non-volatile nature, when you hear of the ROM, that it means it's able to retain data even when the power is off. And this makes it non-volatile. For read-only access, so data in ROM is typically read only. You can only read, as the name says, read only, meaning it cannot be easily written or modified by normal computer process. So it is read only. It can only read, you can write to it. You can write only by using specific um, um, operations to do that. But for the normal computer processing, you will not be able to read. You will not be able to write to it. You know, it can only read what has been written to it. Contains essential software. So ROM often holds firmware, BIOS, or other critical software required for computer booting um, operations. So in terms of the use cases, storing essential system firmware and software. So most times when you hear of the BIOS, they normally are st saved um, in the ROM. So holding the BIOS, which initi initiate the computer hardware and operating system. The BIOS, when it boots the PC for the first time, you sometimes see some black or blue screen telling you press F1 to do this, to do that. So that is where the BIOS comes in. So, the, so that is the BIOS itself. So it runs on the ROM. So before you even go to Windows, you have to pass through the BIOS. And the BIOS is responsible for the initiation of the computer hardware and operating system to talk to each other so that we'll be able to communicate and know 
um, like for the operating system to actually boot. So without a BIOS, you might not be able to even land the operating system. And it is still on the BIOS that we have the post um, power on self test, which is the post operation. They are all stored in the ROM of the BIOS. In the ROM. So read only memory. These are the types that exist. We have the mask ROM, the AP ROM, and the AA ROM. AP ROM. So the max ROM, this, so that is data. Data is permanently written during manufacturing and cannot be modified. That is the max ROM. The erasable programmable, programmable ROM, which is the EP ROM, data can be erased and reprogrammed using ultraviolet light. And we have the, the final type of ROM, which is the electrically erasable programmable ROM. Data can be electrically erased and reprogrammed. So these are the three types of ROMs that exist. This brings us to the end of lecture four. Is it lecture three or four? I think it's lecture three. <laughs> yes, this brings us to the end of lecture three. If there is any question you can ask, if not, then we can move on to lecture four. Do we have any question, please? Sir. Yes. Sir, please, sir, I want to find out from you. In in the in the uh, is it late nineties? We have something called floppy for good life. I think it's not no more in the system. I want to know which come again. Your line is breaking. Your line is breaking. In the nineties, we have something called floppy drive. Floppy, yes, floppy, floppy disk. Yeah, floppy disk. Yeah. Uh, floppy disk drive. Uh, I don't. I want to know which category will this fall and uh, which storage. Uh, yes. Cast, cast in, in, the, in this uh, storage. Yes. So th that that would be an external um, storage medium. That would be an external storage medium. You know, the floppy disks now it is not being used because um, it's unable to store huge data. The floppy disks like three and a half floppy disks. Um, the maximum data that it could store it could save was one point four four megabytes. 1.44 megabytes. So now this gentleman, um, Safo, the Safo new song, the new song that Safo has. Um, what's the name? I think Lord can help me. Uh, yeah, maybe. yeah, what's Safo's new song? What's the name? The, na the name of the song. Yes, the name of the song. Safo, yes. Safo, Safo Newman. Yeah, the, the song, the one that he just brought. Uh, Mabel is laughing. Uh, <laughs> uh, exactly. <laughs> that song, for instance, um, if you download it, it's about three or four megabytes. So it means we can't save even that song on floppy um, disk drive. That is how come floppy disks are no more being used. You know, when you open a floppy disk, you will see a thin film, black film in circle. And that is, it's it's magnetic. And that is what makes it easier to store data. So floppy disks, they were, the maximum size of file you can store is 1.44 megabytes. In our current state, we can't even store one song on a floppy disk. So that is how come most of the computers that are coming in are not giving you the chance to store for, um, files. They are not even bringing in the floppy disk drive for you to even use. So those ones are part of what we call the external storage. I said, um, even for the HDD and SSD, we can also classify them as external. It becomes external when we, when it is not part of the system itself, but rather we have to now connect to it. So SSD is one of them. Um, SSD and HDD, they are all part of it. So for your question, the floppy disks, 
they are no more being used. If we were to use it now, they would fall under external storage devices. So that is it. And I remember those times when I was in school. Um, I had I have used a floppy disk before. And it's funny, those times when you have a floppy disk 1.44, they are giving you assignments. You go and do your typing and you put it on it. By the time it is time for marking, if you are not lucky and sun hits on it, your your saved assignments will vanish. <laughs> the floppy disk will crash. Yeah. And you might have, use it. I have, I have. You've also used I it before. Also used, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's very yeah, I have a question. Yes, please do ask your question. Okay. I have a two terabyte of the HDD drive. Yes. And then it fell it fell down. Now mm -hmm. I can't retrieve my my documents or my whatever data I have on that HDD drive. Uh, yes. I heard from someone that they can open it and then work on the disk inside for me. That is the yes. reason why I bought. That is the reason why I bought the SSD drive two terabyte. So I'm here to ask whether that one is repairable. The HDD yes. drive. Yes, you know it, it is repairable. You know, unfortunately, you know in Ghana, you see how this SSD is. This is the, how yeah. the SSD looks like. Now, even if this component gets broken, this one, even if this component, I don't know if you can see. Hold on. Yes, I can see very well. I don't know. I'm trying to use my mouse to click on something. If this component, any of the components gets even broken, like it hits on the floor and it gets broken, and you don't give it to the right person to, you know, fix it on, um, then it becomes useless. Most of our electrical guys, like the phone repairers, some are not so good, you know. They might not even know the technology that goes be, be, um, behind the circuitry of this and might not be able to fix yeah, it. I'm talking about the HDD. Oh, HDD, this one. Yes, I have two terabytes HDD, which I'm not using it anymore because I can't retrieve the data on the HDD. So I yes. bought the, the HDD drive. So I, have, I still have the HDD with me, which my data and information are on it. And I bought the the SDD drive, two terabyte. This one I have two terabyte for the HDD, two terabyte for the SDD, uh, SSD. So okay. I'm asking that if this this HDD is repairable. Yes, it it is actually repairable. But the unfortunate thing is, we don't have the best of repairs to work on it. You know, this is mechanical. Most times, it is this device, this one, the actuator. Okay. This one. This, okay. the, this thing that that is pulse the the one that is goes on the on the disc most of the time that is what is it's pulse this one this is what is most of the time is pulse so they need to um find a way to either replace it or repair it but unfortunately most people here in Ghana are not electronically savvy to be able to repair it but if you were in China Oh, come on. And they will fix it for you right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. They, they, they will just fix for you right now. You know, of course, it doesn't mean Ghanaians, we, we will not be able to do it. It depends on the person. There are some <laughs> people who are very good who can fix it. Okay. Yeah. And as I said, most of the time, it is this actuator that is probably sports. The arm itself. This is what reads data to... on the disk. So if this gets yeah. broken... Yes. According to our guy, he said the disk can be uh, removed. Maybe they need to fix the disk on it very well. Maybe as it fell, it's it just removed from the from where the the, the previous uh, location. So they need no. to fix no, the disk very well. No, the disk the disk always it, it, it is it is tight. The disk. I don't know if you have anybody who has opened a hard disk before. This is very shiny. Dust should not even get onto it. The disk, there is okay. no way to remove. It is this thing that will get broken. This is what does the reading. This is what does the reading of file file or data on this disk. So if this thing got, gets spoiled or damaged, sometimes there is a break in it. 
Um, I don't know if you can see from here. It has this um this thing thing. That is where it does the reading. I've actually opened one before. You know, you see this fine thing, and the moment it gets corrupted, or it, it's if you don't take care, it can even it can even scratch on the desk to get its paws. Unfortunately, we don't really have you know experts in this area to. Maybe you should go into that field and learn how to repair some of these. But it is repairable. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And you are the, not the only There are big, big companies that have issues like that. And they are unable to retrieve some of their files. So if you go in there, you can charge <laughs> huge sums of money. All right, let's have your second question. The second question is, so I did a little uh, SQL database. All right. I did, I did a database uh, at a game park. Okay. And I want to know where where can I specialize this SQL team as my profession? Okay, so um SQL, which is structured query language, um okay. we normally use it in most uh, most organizations use it for um Let's say database administrators. They are the ones we normally use SQL. Uh, per, for per this course, there is something I might have to teach you, Visual Basic um, for applications. But unfortunately, the way you guys are not here, I don't. I don't think I'll be able to teach you. <laughs> it's a practical thing, and you need to have a computer. Yes. You know, for yeah, I don't think we'll be able That's to. A, have... That that is a command prompt. Yes, for SQL itself does command um you will, so for instance if i want to create a table a table is um let's say you have a folder called lot and in the folder we have what we call files so a table in sql can be classified as a folder and inside the folder you can have um different files so in the we can create a table called lot and within it we can have um name um age so these are entities or attributes of lot so with that you can have so many of records or tuples coming in there but unfortunately from the angle you are going i don't see where <laughs> you would turn <laughs> into a database management system um, software developer no um maybe you will have just a, a general idea of of it but those that want to be database administrators, they have to go a little more further from the basic SQL that you, you just talked about. I teach SQL here, you know, in web programming. We do web development here where students are able to build software, like the admission system. You have your username, you have your password, you log on to the system, you see your records. Now you apply by entering your username, it goes into a database by entering your first name, your last name, your date of birth, all those fields that we take from my, my second year. Now it's even first years. My first years should be able to do a software like that for you, which can run on the web. And in data, in software, in web developments, we have a portion for database. If you are taking information from the user, then it means you need a database to store that information. So that database is what we call MySQL. Um, in other cases, you might also say SQL. They are all structured query languages which can store records of people. From the, ang the angle you are going, I don't think you will need <laughs> to learn much about yeah. SQL. Yeah, it's just that, uh, maybe the knowledge in that, that's all. Yeah. Then I will, I will come and see you personally so that at least I can have some knowledge on it. Uh, don't worry. It's, it's, it's not so difficult. <laughs> yeah, it's not... <laughs> Okay, thanks for the enlightenment. Mm -hmm. All right. Do we have any other question before we move on to lecture no, four? We have Mabel. Mabel was laughing at the background. Mabel, do you have anything to tell us? Hello. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, if we don't have any, then I think we can move straight to lecture four. So I'm going to stop this again and come in again. Um, so that we have that recording too as well. I don't want it to be continuous. I just wanted us to break it. So I'll stop this one.
and we'll come back in for lecture. Oh, are we tired? Should we continue lecture four? And f now we are going to four. Saturday we can finish four. Tired. Five. You, wait, Beatrice, are you tired? Yes. So how many will we have? How many lectures will we have? Depends um, on the number. There are seven of them. Seven. Seven and we have done four. And we have done three now. Ah, uh, three. So let's so, go four. Yes. So next week, if we touch on letter um, four and five, the following Sunday, six and seven, and we are done. Then we start thinking mm -hmm. about the practical aspects. Mm -hmm. Do we all know how to use Word, Excel, PowerPoints? Do we know what? To me, to, to me perfectly. Do we okay. know what? I speak for myself. How to use Do Word? You know how to use Excel, Word, Excel, and mm -hmm. PowerPoint. Yes, of course. <laughs> hey. <laughs> hey, maybe. Maybe. You're talking well, okay. down for maybe. <laughs> Tell me the truth. Oh. Oh no, I said yes. He okay. said my voice is down. He thinks I'm sleeping. I'm I sleeping. can give you something. I can give you something in SL. You can't do it. Yeah, Lord, it. The Oga guy. So, if I'm God willing, if that is the case, then on Saturday we will touch on computer software and computer network, and the internet. And then afterwards, we'll talk about, I think. Uh, but wait, I'm not going to teach Word, but I'll put up a video for you guys to see on Word. So those that would want to know a step um, a little more, do that. There is supposed to be presentation. Yes. But I don't know if... So you guys, you will not be coming to campus at all, eh? <laughs> the next week we are coming. Yeah, please, next week is face to face. Oh, okay. Then if that is the case, if you can, bring your laptops. Okay, okay sir. Uh -huh. So can we go on to lecture four? It's 12 o'clock. It's 11 o'clock. 11, 11 or 12. Mm. It is 11. So you. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have another lecture after this one? Yes, sir. Another one we can, by 1. 1 p.m. Okay, let me see. All right, so then if that is the case, let's meet next week. I think that will be more appropriate. All right, so I will end here. Yes. Yeah.